Today, we continue in, in the uh, King of Kings sermon series, Jesus According to Matthew, and we're at chapter 10. And I kind of called this message Kingdom Assignment, Kingdom Assignment, um, but kind of a co-title is here, Follow the Leader, Follow the Leader. Um, we, we get introduced to assignments young, at a young age, right? So that um, the first kind of introduction to assignments is kind of pick up your toys and you know, clean your plate. I mean, so assignments get introduced to us from a young age, and then they just kind of escalate from there, right? Then there becomes uh, instructions that we, assignments that we give them by teachers and coaches, and then you never get away from it because then you go to assignments from employers or employees or clients, and, and so we kind of live in this, um, this world of assignments. And so th- I figured there's at least four th- necessary things to successfully complete any assignment. All right, at least four. The first is motivation. The motivation, there has to be a motivation to complete the assignment. Either it comes from a sense of duty or it comes from a sense of uh, connection to the person giving the assignment or some connection to how, what, what will happen when the assignment is accomplished. But there has to be some level of motivation or you don't ever complete an assignment. The second is uh, authority. You have to have a level of authority commensurate to the assignment given, right? If you're not giving any authority to complete something, then you can't really make decisions. You only make suggestions. So there has to be motivation, and there has to be um, authority. And then, then you, need, um, you need coaching, right? There needs some kind of instruction or coaching. Because generally speaking, a majority of the assignments that you will get to or be given to you are always going to be just a little bit above where you're at or how you'll get to. Okay, and so the instructions are some of the some of the nitty gritty, the who, what, when, where, how, um, but then coaching along the way. That when the assignments get hard, there becomes someone that comes alongside of you and helps you kind of along the way and get moving forward on that. So we need motivation, we need authority, we need coaching, and then there has to be an ability. There has to be some um, some level of ability inside of you to even start beginning to tackle the assignment. Even though your ability might grow through the process, there has to be some level of ability. And in fact, it would be cruel for anybody to give you an assignment that didn't believe you had what it took to get it, kind of get it moving. Okay? So, so those, those are the four things that we need for any assignment. And I, and I think it's the same way with a kingdom assignment, that there is a connection to how Jesus leads that gives us what's necessary to follow through on his kingdom assignments. The difference is, Jesus, these assignments come from an an omnipotent, which means all-powerful, an omniscient, which means all-knowing, and an omnipresent, which means an ever-present, at all times, everywhere, God. So, So the assignments coming from an omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God, and the assignments come with his presence, and his presence brings all of those to bear with the assignments that he gives. Now, here is, here is the assignment as listed in Matthew chapter 10. Verses 1 through 8 says, Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. So you see already he's given them his authority, all right, his power. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Also notice that he doesn't send them out by themselves. These guys are listed in pairs pretty significant. And then he gives him more instruction. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. There's, there is, there's consistency in the message of Christ. When John the Baptist has come proclaiming Jesus, the message that he was entrusted with was repent, the kingdom of God is near. When Jesus is here. His message was repent. The kingdom of God is near. When he comes back out of baptism and out of the wilderness, he comes and he starts proclaiming the message, repent. The kingdom of God is near. It is a consistent message. Heal the, heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely you have received. 
freely give. Here comes some more power and authority from this omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent God to match the challenge of the assignment. Now, at first blush, you read that and you go, well, that's really good. And, and um, that would seem appropriate for him to give the, the, the disciples. After all, they were with him in person. They had witnessed these things. But at first blush, for us, it's kind of like, you know, way over my head. Well beyond my pay grade. These must be anecdotal. There isn't any way that this assignment comes to us. But it is. And it's important, though, to realize before we get into those particulars that the more that I read the Scripture through the eyes of how Jesus leads, the more confidence I gain in who He is and how He leads me. Does that make sense? You can read the Scripture through a lot of lenses, but one lens I would encourage you to read it through is to read the Gospel through the lens of how Jesus leads. Because that kind of power and authority and, and clarity of direction gives you a lot of power and authority and clarity of direction. And to find how Jesus leads here, all you have to do is turn back a few verses to how Matthew chapter 9 ends. Because G this command, this assignment, isn't capricious, it isn't random, it follows something Jesus did himself, or at least reported of having just done. So we pick this up in Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. Let me say, also say this. Average leaders point, great leaders lead. Average leaders point, great leaders lead. I was in a big box store recently, and I didn't have a lot of time. I was running to get one particular item. So why I chose the largest square foot facility that would have had that, I don't know why, but I did. It was the closest one, and I run in, and I... I made a beeline, found the first associate with the right color smock, and I said, where would I find X? I think I was looking for a, a Bic lighter. Annie, I think it was for you for that, right? And so I'm looking for that, and the first associate I find says, oh, you'll find that in aisle three. Well, I happen to be on aisle 1045, right? I mean, I'm, I'm on this side of the store, but you'll find it in aisle three. So I beelined it to aisle three. I searched up and down aisle three, and it was not on aisle three. So I found another associate. Hey, I'm looking for this lighter. Where do I find it? I mean, I was even nice enough to say, one of your fellow workers just sent me on a goose chase. I didn't, I didn't even go there. I, I didn't want to put any undue pressure on them. And so they said, oh, oh well, that's in aisle 70. It was where I was. So I make a beeline back to the other side of the store. I walk up and down that aisle and see it. I didn't see it because it was on an end cap. So I was actually sent the wrong place and then sort of the right place. And then I found a third associate. And I said, look, this one I was a little bit, a little bit more direct. I'm looking for this. I was told there. I was told here. Can you help me find this? And the person said, yes. Follow me. Which associate got the high five? That's right. I high five an associate in a store because they took me down the aisle. They said, hey, I'm sorry about such and such. And here it is, found it, and went out of the store. Average leaders point. Great leaders lead. Jesus doesn't point. Jesus leads. And we find kind of a breakdown of that here in Matthew 9. He says... Jesus went through all of the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed, helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And then we sit, when we, we flip the page to chapter 10, now he's sending them to do what he already has done. The really first thing how Jesus leads, how we follow him, is that Jesus went. Jesus went, okay? So God is the first giver because he gives us his son for salvation. If God is the first giver, Jesus is the first goer. He moved from where he was. He, he's pulling us along with him that we follow him where he goes. He begins, Jesus went. One of my favorite passages of scripture is in the first chapter of John. It says that Jesus became 
flesh. The word became flesh and it dwelt and dwelt among us. And my favorite translation of that says that um, he became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. First go, or so Jesus goes. That's how he leads his first go. The second thing Jesus did was Jesus taught, he proclaimed, and he healed. All right? Now, what did he teach on? He taught the kingdom of God. There, there, is, there is just a slight distinction between teaching and preaching, okay? Because every good teacher will preach, and every good preacher will teach. Teaching is a methodical way to build on something, right? So it's easy to follow. It builds, and some people love that process, and some people love to hear that process. That is teaching. Proclamation is drawing someone to a conclusion, drawing someone to a decision, having them face what's been taught, and then it sit in front of all our laps, and we go, well, now what do I do with it? What, am, what are you calling me to do? And so Jesus was teaching people about the kingdom of God and how different it was to this kingdom, how what this kingdom kept falling short in doing, how the kingdom of God exceeded anybody's expectations. And then he proclaimed the kingdom because it was a proclamation of repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. And then he healed. Now, this is really interesting. What role does healing play? Well, we live in a time, just when Jesus came, that we live in a time that's called, um, theologians will say, the, um, the right now and not yet. That the kingdom of God comes. It has, it has come in the person of Christ. It comes in the, in the way of salvation. The kingdom of God is here. We live in part in the kingdom of God, but it's not yet either. That the fullness of the kingdom won't be experienced until we're in heaven. So when, when Jesus healed, he was bringing a part, another part of the power of the kingdom to the right now. It was a demonstration of the kingdom of God and a little bit of a taste of what heaven would be like. Because we're told in heaven that we'd have, we'll have new bodies. I, I knelt to take a picture with Cole out here in the hallway. It took me a little longer to get back up. I had to explain it was two knee surgeries, right? And so there, there, there'll, there'll be a time where there's a new body. But make no mistake. Every person Jesus healed still died. Every person he raised from the dead still died. It, it, there, there, is a, there is a taste of heaven that comes, and, it, and it's a demonstration of his power. And here was, he came with not just words, they came with power, and it was very, very difficult. People could dismiss what Jesus said. It was very difficult for them to dismiss, dismiss what they saw him do. You with me? I mean, when someone's blind and then they're seeing again, when someone's lame and they're walking again, someone's dead and they're living again, it's very difficult to dismiss who this person is saying that. So Jesus taught, proclaimed, and healed, which is what he is instructing us to do in Matthew 10. And this is Jesus saw. Jesus saw. There's a difference in noticing and seeing. Noticing is what you do on the way, on the way to do something else. Seeing has your attention. One of, the, one of the first trips that I, that I took overseas when, after my daughter was born, she was about six months old, and uh, when I was a missions pastor, and we had a, we had a, we had a missionary in uh, South Africa, and I was flying to be with him and his family and to see all of the work that was being done and how we could participate as a church. And um, now, back then, there was, like, there was no cell phones, no world cell phones, at least not unless you were CEO of some big company, right? And so I had, I had no contact. In, uh, internet, uh, email was in its infancy. Um, you had a CompuServe address. Anybody remember this? And you had like 12 digits or was your address CompuServe? No, nobody. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, but when I got back, when I got back, now Annie's six months old. Um, they met me at the top of the Escalator International Concourse in Atlanta where they could still go. And when, when, um, when Annie saw me at six months, I, I didn't know, like, what would happen. But she, you know, she's holding me, and she put her mouth. There you are right there. Come over and stand next to me. No, okay. So, <laughs> so she put her mouth right here on my cheek, and she would not take her mouth off my cheek. And then each time I tried to talk to Gina, she did this. Consistently. So we ride the train to get to the next con. She's holding my we got to the van. I had to sit in the back seat next to her car seat. And, and she would do that until she fell asleep. What's the point? The point is Annie didn't want to be around this homecoming. She wanted me to see her. See, and we live too much life noticing and not enough life seeing. 
seeing is being present in. And so God's call here, what Jesus was doing was he was going about this, his kingdom business, but he was doing it in this kingdom, and he saw. And what he saw were people that were harassed and helpless. That, that they kept looking for one thing, but the world only kept prom- promising everything, but only kept delivering way down here. And he saw, that, I mean, the, even the words are important, aren't they? Harassed. Harass this, this continual not leaving alone and helpless, not being able to do anything about it. And he sees them harassed and helpless, and then he makes this declaration. His declaration is, therefore, pray and ask the Lord of the harvest to send forth workers into the harvest field. And what I love here, he never shames the harvest. He never blames the harvest for being the harvest. He doesn't say, yeah, those people. They're a mess. He doesn't see them as a mess. He sees them as harassed and helpless. See, we we notice messes, but when you start seeing, you don't see messes. You see pain. You see brokenness. You see disappointment. And when he saw them in that state, he was moved with compassion. Noticing brings no compassion. Presence and seeing brings compassion. So, so when I say that Jesus doesn't just point, he didn't just round up the 12. I said, okay, fellas, you've been around me here for a couple years. So it's time for you to get up your, off your backside and do a little something here for the kingdom. What he demonstrated is he demonstrated what the proclamation brought, what the healing did. He demonstrates that. And listen, in no accounts, there's two other accounts, Mark and Luke. It's like Mark 6 and Luke 9 are inverted. There's no indication that the disciples said, yeah, I'm not really up for that. There's no indication of them saying, well, we need a couple more months under your wing before we start doing that. There, there's, there's no indication at all. The indication is they're chomping and ready to get after it. It's kind of like we've been watching this for a while. We're ready to be in on it for a while. I mean, it, it, it is a wonderful, and then you'd have to read another account in another gospel where they come back pretty, pretty fired up to how things happened. Hey, people, people were healed, and demons were cast out, and lepers were clean. And Jesus kind of brings them a little bit down to earth and say, look, look, don't rejoice over that. Because after all, that was my power, not yours. What he says is, rejoice that your names are written in the kingdom of heaven. Let all of our joy still rest, not in what we do, but in who we are. And he's calling us with this assignment into the kingdom, and he's led us into that because here now, 10, 5 through 8, back to where we started. These 12, Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Don't go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. Pastor, why did he tell him to do that? Because still the promise to Abraham was that Israel was blessed to be a blessing. And that would be their call, these disciples' call. It will be after Pentecost, does the church now start participating and penetrating the Gentile world? And he gives them the same instructions as he did. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. How? Freely you have received freely you give. There's authority, there's coaching, there's ability, okay, and all of that. Um, the, first I, the first thing I know, you look at it and you go, well, these 12 people, they're superstars. They've walked with Jesus all this time. There's no way I can measure up to a disciple. And I want to remind you that there were no five-star recruits in Jesus' group of disciples. So my, for my college fans in here, No five-star recruits, no four-star recruits, no three-star recruits. They were zero-star recruits and negative-star recruits. Jesus did not assess their ability. He imparts it. He doesn't assess power. He imparts it. Okay? And so, so don't get intimidated by that. The successful completion of the assignment demonstrates the transformative power that walking with Jesus produces. And the sheer magnitude of the force of his power over the enemy. Here's a fact. God's assignments for us are not commensurate with our talent, but with our faith and our willingness to follow. 
And I would say our willingness to follow is always a demonstration of our faith. My faith isn't demonstrated by how loud I speak, talk, pray, preach. The demonstration of my faith is my willingness to follow. So here it is. He says, he tells them in verse 7, as you go, as you go, going and seeing will always come hand in hand. I will make this declaration. If you find yourself kind of bored in your, in your faith, disconnected from church, if you will, if there is some kind of dissatisfaction and you've been in church maybe a while, my contention is it's not from a lack of hearing, it's from a lack of going. Going energizes, right? A body of motion wants to stay in motion. A body of rest wants to stay at rest. In, in, in our movement comes the power of the kingdom. You know, I did. I enjoyed the two Sundays I had. I enjoyed listening to, to, to the message. I enjoyed worshiping without thinking about what I needed to do next. If you can put yourself in my shoes. I enjoyed it. But you know what really made me smile? The amount of people I met serving the body from the moment we got out of our car to the moment I got to my car. See, because I had unique eyes, right? So, so my eyes were like, well, this person's offering to drive me up to the, to the church, and he's having conversation with me, and now I'm, this person's handing me this and speaking to me, looking me in the eye, and this person's offering me this. And then it was a little, little, little strange, though, because we they had a special prayer for fathers, and I was in shorts. I was in shorts and a golf shirt. That was also pretty special. Don't be surprised sometime this summer in July when I might sneak a pair of shorts in on you. And um, they said, turn around, pray for a father near you. And this woman in front of me turned around and laid her hand on my knee. So that was a little, <laughs> that, that was a little friendly. I'm, that was a little friendly. Um, but I, seeing the joy in the people going, even in their own body, are you with me? Because they don't know who they're engaging with. They don't know 20,000 people. They don't know if I've been there since the beginning or if I just walked in right out of a gutter. Right? They don't know. So they're engaging everybody with the same attitude. And it's fantastic. The going in your faith is where, is where you'll start seeing all this kind of life demonstrated. All right? So, so they, so they, they went. Um, uh, and then they proclaimed this message. Um, the proclamation is pretty much what you're looking for can't be found where you're looking for it. That, that kind of becomes this kingdom proclamation to this kingdom. Hey, what you're looking for can't be found in where you're looking for it. And then when we come to proclaiming it in this manner, that the healing the sick and cleansing of leprosy, and I don't know why leprosy is kind of ratcheted out here, except it was a significant issue in the first century, and it, it was a physical condition, but it was also a spiritual condition because you couldn't go to the temple if you were a Jew. So, so it removed you from worship as well. It was more than, a, it was a physical separation for you from the nation, but it was also a spiritual separation. So there's a lot of things going on here with this list, and, and it could be easy to say, well, I can't do that. I can't. Pastor, if this is not anecdotal, then what it's saying is our assignment is to heal the sick. First, let me say, we can't heal anybody. But let me be the next to say, God still, still heals people today. It is still his kingdom that comes now. So how can I make such a declaration? Because there's plenty of people in the body of Christ who feel like that miracles ceased with the last apostle. And I don't know if I can argue that theologic with you. I think I can. I don't want to. I don't enjoy it. But, but, but let me say this. I was a freshman in college. First two weeks, I still hook up with a team to start playing softball. We were playing a tournament. And in, in those that softballs came in different um, softness, if you will. And this one was a red dot. Anybody familiar with a red dot? Anybody? Hard, right? It is hard. And I took a one-hop line drive off a rock right to the face. I know you're supposed to use the hand, but the face was more convenient. <laughs> and and I, I, was, I was still tenacious enough as a ball player coming out of high school that I'm, I was down, right? The, the, the speed at the ball was not my problem. I, I'm down ready to take it off the chest. It didn't have to do to keep it from going, but I took it off the face. I mean, these bones are not strong, right? 
this orbital bones, nose. And I remember spinning. I'm hitting the ground. And I remember saying, just praying, Lord, don't let my nose be broken. And I remember reaching up and my, everything moved. And, um, you know, it was, it was a Christian college. So presumably there was other Christians. And, and some guys prayed for me. And then, you know, one guy, I, I mean, I got blood on his shirt. They, they take me to the hospital. And I'm all prepared for, you know, not being able to go back to school and not worrying about the, the damage the softball caused, but the damage that my mom and dad was going to cause having been just two weeks on campus. And the x-ray, nothing. Nothing. Everything was fine. I remember preaching at a youth camp. Grade school kids. Our grade school kids, third, fourth, and fifth graders, went off to camp today. I was speaking at one, and the little girl, eight years old, we, we connected from, like, the first day. Her name was Melissa. But by the middle of the week, Melissa's hands and feet were starting to swell. And um, we got concerned. Single mom was there as a counselor. Uh, her and I and this director took, took, took them to the hospital. Um, I'm, carrying, I'm carrying Melissa in with her mom. Um, it wasn't long. The doctor calls me back, not the mom, back and opening, literally opening journals in front of me, demonstrating to me what sickle cell anemia is and saying she has sickle cell and she won't live past 12. Now, now, I'm, now I'm stuck with mom. But we, when we prayed for Melissa, I believe what God told me was the same doctors that told me that she was going to die were going to be the same doctors to tell me that she was going to live. So the whole camp, you know, the next two days, you got all these grade schoolers, grade schoolers pouring out their faith and prayer. It was a week later. I'm back in New Jersey. I drive to Philadelphia where the hospital is. As I'm walking into the room, Melissa's jumping up and down on her bed. Her mom's running around circles in the room. And the two doctors that told me with the documentation that she had sickle cell were walking out scratching their heads because there was nothing wrong with her blood. Listen, and there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stories of the manifestation of the kingdom of God healing now. So what's my point, Pastor? My point is when, when I am going in my assignment and I am seeing that I am to respond in the power of the kingdom, which means is if I know that some things are, I come, to, I come to understand that there's something going on in your life, whether physical or emotional, spiritual, that I can say, hey, Jerry, is it okay if I pray with you? I don't know how long I've been doing that, but let's just safely say close to four decades and I've had, never had anybody tell me no. No one has ever told me no that I couldn't pray for them. Now, they might not have understood it. I might not have touched them if I didn't know them that well. But I stood and I prayed with them. Here's what that does. God wants to work in their life more than, than, more than they want God working in their life. Okay? He wants to demonstrate to them that he is alive and well. Now, I can pray in secret. But if I pray in secret, how in the world do they know what just happened? But when I tell them, can I pray for you, and, and I will pray for you, and then something happens, it's very difficult not to, for them not to connect those dots. So the kingdom assignment, we go, we move, we see, and we carry this message of the kingdom. Listen, you, you can easily say, well, what if, what if God doesn't heal them, then what? Here's how I've, here's how I've come to reconcile that. One, I don't understand all what God does or how and why he does, but I always know he's still a good God. The second is, it's not my responsibility to defend God. You really got to get over that one. I lived with that a long, long time. Well, God, but if this doesn't happen, do I need to go back and say, well, you know, there's this nuance about suffering in Scripture. No. I stay in my lane. God has no lanes. Right? My lane, as I, when I, if I'm going and I'm seeing, then I'm praying. I'm praying. And I am, I'm allowing the kingdom of God to come alive in that situation. Um, all right. I'm preaching long here like I did in the first service, but I have two weeks to make up for. <laughs> so it would be all nice and rosy until you read the rest of Matthew chapter 10. You read the rest of Matthew chapter 10 and you realize that this kingdom movement comes with kingdom opposition. This kingdom assignment comes with 
kingdom opposition. We read it, verse 16. Jesus, I love the way he leads because he's honest. I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Thank you, Jesus. Just watched the History Channel special on the reintroduction of wolves into Yosemite. It's a fascinating thing. Here's what I didn't know. What I didn't know was the wolf was the primary grade A predator at, at, at Yellowstone. There was no predator above, in the food chain above the wolf. None. It hurt me when I read this again, right? Um, we're sending you uh, like sheep among wolves. Sheep can't protect themselves. They're not the brightest animal. So who protects the sheep? The shepherd. So when he says that the people were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd, even though we're being sent out among wolves, we go with the shepherd. That's helpful. He says, be shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. Really weird phrase. He's saying, be wise. Paul tells us to be wise in your dealings with outsiders, he says, people outside the faith. The innocence here is, don't be doing this with any self-interest. There needs to be zero self-interest. That's not moving in the kingdom if there's self-interest. So be wise. No self-interest. And he says, be on your guard. You will be handed over to local councils to be flogged in synagogues. It's bitter. It gets better and better. Interesting. Paul was told that he would speak before kings, but he did so in chains. Historical counts and Christianity say that they changed the guard with Paul. They had to change his guard often because they kept being converted into the kingdom of God. That there are some places the gospel never goes, can't ever get into without getting into it this way. But the interesting thing he says is, but don't, don't be concerned about what you will say in those times because my Holy Spirit will talk for you. So freely we've been given, freely we give. This comes with the authority and the presence of Christ. And when you find yourself in situations where you really are in over your head, that we're patient to hear how the Holy Spirit would speak. They recognized, they recognized the disciples as unschooled and ordinary men. The difference was they had been filled with the Holy Spirit. It became a power and authority that came from them. You will be. And then he says, brother will betray brother to death. Father, his child, children will rebel against their parents. And you read that and you go, what is this all about? And what it's all about is the kingdom of God always brings separation because there's always a choice. When the kingdom of God comes, choices have to follow. This kingdom is, has, a hard time, will ha has a hard time receiving his kingdom because it has a hard time recognizing what its disease is and its sin. And if you can't recognize what the disease is, you cannot then lend yourself to the remedy. The remedy is repentance. So there's, there's no wonder that there is so much conflict between kingdoms is because, and I'll tell you, we in, in, in his kingdom underestimate the power of sin. That, that sin is devastating. And we underestimate how devastating sin is and how devastating following a sinful path is. I would think that if we would understand at a greater depth the depravity that sin brings, we would increase our kingdom assignment activity. And so do you just back down when there is opposition? No, not to prove a point, but to demonstrate the love of God. See, I don't want to argue with anyone over any sin or anything. I don't like arguing at all about anything. And so many people would rather just not have a conversation than get in any kind of... Ar you, you can proclaim the kingdom and not get into an argument. your ability to articulate, say, I, I, I talk pretty good. You back me in the corner, and I'm not a bad talker. But God hasn't, hasn't called me to talk my way out of stuff. He's called me to demonstrate the love of God. 
and the love of God in situations that calls for an argument, that calls for confrontation, when, it, when, when we lead with the love and compassion of Christ, when we give something we freely received, it's amazing how it can disarm any conversation. Let's not forget that the scripture says that it is his kindness that leads to repentance. It doesn't say it's his rightness. It doesn't even say it's his power. It says his kindness. Kingdom assignment carried in kindness. Kind of ends the chapter by saying the student's not above his teacher. They called me Beelzebub. They called me the called me Satan. How much more were they call you that? But we're the problem. We're increasingly getting to a place in our world where Christianity is going to be labeled the problem for the world. We, we, we are in a, we're, we're not just post-Christian. It used to be called that we were post-Christian society. We are a pre-Christian society, which means we're more first century than we, we are anything else, okay? And so Christianity, religion, will be, will be blamed more and more the older you and I get, and it will be labeled the enemy. That's where we're going. And we have to lead with these kingdom assignments and not be afraid because Jesus says, don't be afraid of them. And then he says, even the hairs of your head are numbered. That's really a cool thing to say. I mean, that's pretty poetic. Where he, he, he is, He's trying to get so down, so down into the details with you and I to say, I, I know even when a hair comes out, not only do I know it, I have a record of it. And so where you find yourself in these assignments, you're not by yourself. It's not self-powered. You freely received, freely that you give. Erica, you guys and the team can come up. I understand that in a war, it's safer to stay put and keep your head down than it is to engage And it might feel safer, but it's not. No war is ever won in retreat. Um, it says that the kingdom, the kingdom of God is at such a strength. It says that the gates of hell can't prevail against the kingdom of God. So, so gates are stationary. The kingdom of God moves. So wherever the kingdom of God moves... The gates that have been established that says you're not moving past here, they don't have the power and the authority to withstand the kingdom of God moving. You and I are the kingdom of God. You and I collectively together are the kingdom of God. You and I individually, we're the kingdom of God. When the kingdom of God resides inside of us and we enter into a situation By prayer or presence, we are bringing his kingdom to bear. And so how I want to conclude the the message today is around two kind of unique ways. One is the, the vision, the purpose of the establishment of Gateway is is to develop and call and send as many people as possible with this kingdom assignment. You know, I've told you the story at nauseum, but, you know, we, Gene and I were really comfortable in Annie. We were really comfortable where we were in Atlanta. And it was a, it was a great place to live. We were in a brand new home. Um, uh, we, loved, we loved the church. We loved the people we served. We loved the pastor that we served under. There wasn't any element that we were running away from. None. In fact, we were leaving our family by coming. And I believe Gateway was established on the day and where Jean and I were walking around the backside of our neighborhood and, and, I, and she asked me, are you sure you heard from God because it was that big of a decision? And I said, I'm not, I'm not really sure. What I know is that if we don't do this, I'll regret it the rest of my life. And her response was, then let's go. I believe with all my heart, that was the day. That was the day our church was established. And it was all around this idea that this world needs his kingdom. 
you know, first question we got asked when we moved to Franklin, does Franklin need another church? And um, it was a pretty disheartening question to answer 13 years ago. Well, we drove somewhere yesterday and we counted 28 churches on one road. Um, and my best witty response was, well, does it need another bank? Because there were banks going up everywhere, right? We didn't move because Franklin, Tennessee needed another church. We moved because what God was calling us to do was to develop more spiritually influential and impactful people. Now, we are a church, and we call ourselves a church, and we're at 1288 Lewisburg Pike as a church. But we're not here just to do church things. That's not what our calling is, to just go about doing church things. Our call is a kingdom assignment to go and to see, to carry the authority of God that's been given to us. And yes, it's, it's over our heads. Come on now. It's over our heads. But it's not over his head. And I don't have to lead this thing. I just have to follow. I, I need to have enough faith to see something that I can't see. But to have enough faith to follow Christ in front of me who I can't see. So part of this response time is, will you receive this kingdom assignment? even without full measure of understanding of where that's going to go or where that's going to take you or who it's going to take you to, will you receive this kingdom assignment today? We have the motivation. We have the authority. The scripture gives us the, the, scripture gives us the coaching. And you have the ability because he's calling. The second, I thought, since we've talked about healing today, I want to have a time to pray for people who need healing. If you have a physical, emotional, need, or maybe you want to stand in for someone that does. In a moment when I call for prayer, come down front. One of the pastoral staff or elders will anoint you with oil. We'll pray for you as it's instructed in the book of James. So Father, we're here in your midst today at the conclusion part, concluding part of this service, and, and we've hit the proclamation part. Lord, the part where Lord, you bring to our attention once again that we live in a place full of people that are harassed and helpless. And will our eyes look past or will we be filled with compassion to act, to proclaim your kingdom, that this kingdom here over promises and under delivers, but your kingdom always delivers. And wherever you'll send us, and even more personally, wherever you'll send me, Lord, we receive your kingdom assignment. And if that's you today, I just want you to stand up. Yes, Lord, I will receive your kingdom assignment. I will go and give freely what you've been given to, given to me freely. And I think it's important for you to stand up. Lord, I receive this kingdom assignment. I receive this kingdom assignment. It's not connected to your ability. It's connected to your willingness to follow. I will receive this kingdom assignment. Father, everything will work against this movement. But your power eclipses whatever opposition there is to your power. And Lord, I pray that you give them the kind of clarity of sight and compassion of heart that they have yet to experience. And then when they go to try to fix it themselves and get overwhelmed, remind them that their, your call is not for them to fix it. But your call for them is to pray and insert the kingdom there with them. And Lord, and I know that you will empower them and they are going out as sheep among wolves, but Lord, you are our shepherd. In the name of Jesus, we claim it.